Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, today we are talking about a topic that is very dear to the hearts of uh, many business owners and certainly many advisors in the business sell and acquisition space. It relates to that terrible moment when business owners sometimes realize that they have spent years building a business that has no value at sale. So today we have a two-part series all about that moment of reckoning when you realize that a business has no valued exit and indeed how then to turn that unsaleable business into a business with value at exit. Now, in order to talk about this very juicy topic, we have on board the absolutely fabulous Glenn Carlson from Dent Global. Now, Glenn is an absolute delight to speak to and to work with, and he runs a really fabulous structured accelerator program that produces entrepreneurs that stand out, scale up, and make a positive impact in the world all while moving their business from one that may not have any value at sale to one that is absolutely brimming in value, which can be particularly helpful at exit. In fact, Dent Global itself has three acquisitions under its belt in technology, media and publishing. And so Dent knows a thing or two about the concept of value at sale and at acquisition. And in this two-part series, Glenn walks us through uh, his own story, which is a really interesting story of his moment of reckoning earlier in his business career when he found that a business that he'd put his blood, sweat and tears in for many, many, many years was actually completely unsaleable, had no value um, at exit. And we talked to Glenn about what he learnt from that experience, how he managed to turn it all around and the lessons that he can pass on to you, our listeners. So buckle in, here we go for part one of our two-part series, all about how to turn an unsaleable business into a business with value at exit. Glenn, hi. Welcome to the Deal Room Podcast. I'm excited. (laughs) Glenn, I am super excited as well. (laughs) Thank you for... uh... Thank you for inviting me. I hope I do it justice. I'm- <laughs> My absolute pleasure. I've been looking forward to this one for a while because you have got a fabulous story, um, a fabulous story. So maybe um, maybe give us a bit of an overview, cast your mind back to, I, I guess, a de- was it a decade ago that um, you're in your previous business that you've been yeah, building no, for a while? Two, dec- two, two uh, decades. Two, 2002. Yeah, the start of the first business. Yep, and tell us a bit about it. What was the business? Yeah, so well, I, I also find it's interesting if I if I can contrast where we are now. So currently, we do about uh, we do about ten million in revenue as a group. We've acquired three different businesses, and we've expanded from one city um, to now we've we've had operations throughout the UK, USA, Singapore, Australia, and Canada. And we have a, a valuable business. We have shareholders, and it was not that in the GFC. Mm. So our business got destroyed. Mm. Um, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, mm. and everything we learned in that two thousand eight, two thousand nine period, we tried to reverse engineer and go, all right. And I, I think we were late twenties, maybe yeah, late twenties at the time. And so we thought, okay. This clearly happens as a cycle, right? Because we mm. actually started our first business on the back of Y two K and nine eleven, right? Mm-hmm. So two thousand one, two thousand two. But we were too young to kind of know 
that oh, this is this is a recession. We're just like, oh, this is what it is, and so we started right. And so then we got hit in the face in the real GFC, and then we thought, okay, how would we want to design our business uh, to become valuable, uh, scalable, but also resilient the next time you know the economy kind of falls off a cliff. So if I go all the way back to the to the first business, I mean. Essentially, Joanna, we were promoters. We'd promote speakers. Mm. Um, so we were marketers that ran a boutique small marketing agency to promote business authors and speakers. Um, and we got very good at promoting people, basically. Mm. And we, within year three, we're doing about 10 million in sales. Mm. And look, there's, I know we don't have a huge amount of time. So there was high highs and low lows. The whole thing fell apart. We had to rebuild it. But I mean, we're mid 20s. We didn't know what we were doing. And then we expanded to the UK. So we're doing about 150 events a year. We got pretty damn good at promoting people. We, we start to get a, got a really good sense. It actually has very little. And this is the whole premise of our business now it had very little to do with the marketing of the person and it had so much more to do with the positioning of the person in the industry to start with and so yeah. w- we'd go in and we'd you know help them write books and we'd help them make sure that they were winning awards and showing up in social media so when people googled them we made sure they had a really powerful message so when we marketed them we had something to market Hmm. I suppose. So we would we would see it would be very easy to fill an audience for some people and very hard to fill an audience for others. And that was kind of the insight. But anyway, so we, we had these insights that we didn't really know were valuable, right? We were just we were packaging up these people to make our business more successful and our cost per uh, cost per lead cheaper. Mm. essentially and you know this is back before facebook and all that sort of stuff we were using fax broadcasting and (laughs) broad broadsheet uh newspaper advertising you know old school yeah and then we expanded to the uk and at the time we were running about four four or five speakers so we were we were promoting some people back in australia we're promoting some people in the uk uh and then you know these silly buggers with their uh, credit default swaps went and <laughs> screwed the world up. And we had some big exposure to uh, the US dollar. Uh, the pound dropped 40% against the dollar overnight and that was the first punch in the face and it didn't stop for about a year. Mm. And we didn't know. We didn't know to radically drop costs. We didn't know how long it could go. And uh, anyway. It got to the point where when we tried to sell the business. Now, here's the thing. We were still doing millions in revenue. Mm. We had a great team. We had a great culture. uh, And yet everyone that was looking at our business from an acquisition perspective just said it's worthless. Um, And we're like. (laughs) And why? Well, so we had all of these assets in the business and because we, we we did our first year of uni before we dropped out and we did accounting 101 and we learned around, about plant machinery and capital. Mm. And so, you know, we thought we'd been smart uh, because we run events. We bought all of our own AV equipment. We had a truck full of AV equipment and we were building a database and, you know, we had a culture and, and we kind of assumed that all those things were valuable. But when it came to sell, um, they just rip it apart and go, yeah, but you can you can jump on Amazon and buy audio equipment secondhand on the cheap. So really mm. that's not worth anything. Mm. But what about our database of 100,000 people? It's like, well, okay, how much does it cost to acquire a lead? About three bucks at the time. So, okay, that's worth 300 grand. Um, what about our culture? Yeah, nah. <laughs> you know, for a small business, like, yeah, nah. Uh, great mm. team? Yeah, nah. Systems? Yeah, nah. Um, mm. You know, systems you could pay someone a few months um, to, mm. to develop and, you know, all of a sudden. So all of a sudden, you know, what we th- we thought were these kind of rock star business owners that were doing all this cool stuff and, and all of a sudden the business is worthless. The GFC is coming on with a vengeance and we're cooked, uh, mm. absolutely burnt out. And um, the M&A guy that was kind of giving us some advice and just pointing out our inadequacies said, look, the, <laughs> the trick is unique IP, right? The, the trick is how to develop unique IP. Uh, what makes Coke valuable is not Coke's logo or, you know, the contracts it has to get cheap tin for its cans or aluminium or whatever it is. Um, you know, it's in the secret ingredients of Coke, mm. right? It, it's, it's the fact that Pepsi can't quite get Pepsi to taste like Coke that makes Coke 
cope. Mm. And, you know, Colonel Sanders, secret herbs and spices. These were the analogies we were given at right, the time. Right, right, right. Got to kind of find your own. And we're like, well, what do you mean? And, and he pointed out, he's like, you guys are in the business of promoting speakers. Look at Stephen Covey. He was still alive at the time. Stephen Covey, seven habits of highly su- successful people. And we're like, oh, yeah, we can relate to that because we sort of promoted people like him. He's like, well, those seven habits are unique. Right, You can't get them from any other business consultant in the world. If you want the seven habits in your organization, you've got to go through Stephen Covey. Now, the fact that he licensed that unique IP to, I think it was 4,000 coaches, which is how he was able to sell the business for $130 million. Now, we had no idea, but we we're like, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty serious. And he pointed it to us and he said, you guys have got, you know, you guys know how to position people as influencers in their industry. This was before influencers was a word. This was mm. before Instagram, you know, and before any of that. But you guys know how to do that, but you've been doing it with a grand total of maybe 10 people over the last 10 years. What if you help thousands of people um, understand those things that you've learnt how to do uh, in, a, in a very serious way and build a very serious business around? But the problem is you haven't, you know, you went and, Develop the personal brands and reputations and positioning all of, of all of your uh, of all of your clients, but you didn't do it for yourself. Uh, and so the now irony. it's kind of now it's kind of to yeah we're plumbers with the leaky taps. Yeah, yeah. So we had to go yeah. and do it for ourselves, and that was the I guess that was the light bulb moment that the the most valuable stuff in an organization is not the stuff you buy from someone else from somewhere else, but it's the stuff that you come up with on your own and, and mm. literally create out of your head and put it on a piece of paper and then publish it or, you know, package it up in some way that you can yeah. own and then all of a sudden that's really unique and that's really valuable and it was just a total mind flip for us. Mm. And so, I mean, I love the story here because it demonstrates what we talk about with our clients so often about the issue that we see at where businesses come to the point of exit and suddenly realize that there's either very little value or nowhere near the value that they had anticipated they get at exit. That's a really hard discussion at any point. But particularly when someone has spent their life building a business and they only mm. realise this right at the right end the when, they're, yeah. w- when they're at retirement. So, you know, you had the luck where you burnt yourself out before that point, right? Okay, so and, mm. and learnt that lesson really early on. And, and I think it's such a critical lesson because you don't want to be the person that discovers that, uh, that disappointment, you know, right at the end when you can't do anything about it. There's really got to be a a more thorough understanding of assets, I think, from a business perspective. Because Mm. if you had a house that was dilapidated, you wouldn't expect to sell it for a lot of money, you know, and you you build a bit, develop a house or create a house, but over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, which is how long lots of people have been building their businesses before they want to try and sell them. You know, the house has fallen apart again, but I mean, businesses, they're so hard to see that because it's so intangible. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's not until someone tries to value your business with a checkbox of, you know, 200 little little squares that they need to put a tick in to develop this value that they start seeing, oh, yeah, no, there's mold on the corner there and there's water leaking through the wall over there yeah. and, you know, the electrics are shot and the plumbing shot and the, oh, the foundation's cracked and it's like, ah. Whereas at least in a property you can, it's, it's, it's visually arresting, yeah. you know, if you've got an asset deficiency where the asset deficiencies in businesses tend to be hidden. Unless yeah. you're actively looking to, um, I guess, document, codify, benchmark all the different kind of categories of assets you've got in your in your business. But look, I, I hear of it all the time as well. One of the things that I say to people is, look, your business value will double double the moment you go away for six months, and it makes mm. still makes money. Yeah, a hundred percent correct. Because I think what happens, and you know, this discussion that we're having about the disappointment at exit, I have time and time and time and time again with business brokers and and corporate advisors who are working with business owners at exit. Right, so yeah. they they totally get it. But businesses are really slow to understand. And and I think the reason is because um, the mechanics of running a business, and you sort of alluded to it um, earlier when you were talking about your story, the mechanics of running a business require that as business owners, we have a really strong eye on revenue and profit. And I think there's this belief that revenue and profit equals value value. at sales. That was our paradigm. 
Yeah. Like we're doing millions in revenue, yeah. we're making profit, this is great. Um, and because everyone talks about, you know, a business is worth X multiple at exit, mm-hmm. but no one talks about when you actually take it to market, it's not just about, yes, multiples are what are being used to publicly compare, but that is not where the value in a business actually is. You know, it's in the ability of the systems, the business to run itself, the ability of the business. And it's, and it's the difference between a multiple of three and 13. 100%. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's what makes up that little multiple. <laughs> <There's> two <laughs> yes. little lines that cross it. There's a lot in that multiple. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, so in how you work with businesses now, you see a lot of businesses. So you, I guess you have the opportunity to see across industries and, and across yeah. many, many businesses. So before businesses coming into you, when, when you initially see businesses, how many businesses do you think in SMEs we're talking about here are, are caught in the um, this reality of having a business that probably has very little value at sale. 99.5%. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to look, I mean, I think what, a 1,000 businesses sell a year in Australia and the vast majority of those are sort of corporate mergers, acquisitions, spin-off, things like that. The amount of small businesses that actually sell. Um, I mean, the moment that most people get their head around the fact that a business isn't really worth anything, and look, when I say sell, I'm saying why bother unless it's going to be a life-changing amount of money, Mm. right? And for most businesses to be worth being bought, they've got to be doing about $10 in revenue, $2 in profit, or it's just not worth the paperwork, you know? Um, (laughs) know, And if they do sell it, it's certainly not for a life-changing amount of money. Yeah. Right. Unless there's some radical, unique thing that you have that some a big company wants, like they're buying your talent, or but that's you know typically you'll be doing much larger. You'll be at a much larger level than the SME than than just that. So no, I find that the vast majority of businesses just aren't even close to being saleable. Most businesses that I see have been cobbled together out of a, a business owner kind of reacting to market forces and just trying to build a job and then build a business and, yeah. you know, put their kids through school and and they're yeah. kind of reacting to the noise of the market and the business and team and systems and processes and government and tax and it's just this big reaction. So, no, I think, I think the vast majority are woefully um, under-equipped to even consider exiting. Um, and I think, you know, for the vast majority, it's a three-year build of mm. focus, like we're going to sell this thing for the max and it's got to be a total overhaul of systems, culture, assets, sales, marketing, operations, leadership, brand, and and how all of those things can knit together and continue to perform and even grow while the founder's on a holiday totally unplugged. And that's what I say, like, you know, your, your value of your business doubles when you can go away for six months, comes back, and it's still working. It's like the most valuable thing you can do is not be in your business. Yeah. And, and that's just often for the vast majority, it's a total, I mean, most businesses are evolutions of jobs and people just bring that same mindset of I've got to work hard um, in my business and they'll find a way to work hard. And they'll find a way to build themselves into it. And so many people get so much personal satisfaction from that. They've been trained that, you know, your value is in how hard you work every day. And mm. that's just its not how I see the world. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it through your lens, Glenn. I love it through your lens. So, look, I absolutely, I agree with everything that you're saying here because we see it day in, day out, you know, and um, and and I just think that it's so sad, as I said before, that um, that businesses only recognise this. It's not just at the point of retirement. It can also be businesses come to a point of exit because they're um, a bit like perhaps you were uh, back in back in the days before you tried to sell your first business. They're, they're worn out, you know. Yeah, they're cooked. Being a business owner, being an entrepreneur is it's like a bloody exhausting process, you know. Yeah, and which is the worst time to sell a business, right? The yeah, moment absolutely. you want to sell the business is the worst <laughs> time to sell the business. The only time to sell a business is when you don't want to sell the business. That's the time to sell the business. So get yeah. the business to the point where you're like, actually, I don't want to sell this thing. Um, that's the time to sell it. Because it's running so smooth yeah. with, uh, without the, yeah. uh, you know, the, the effort and the energy yeah. that's driving why, you. Why would ground. someone else want the piece of shit that's run you into the ground? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm with you. I hear you. 
Well, that's it for part one of our two-part series, all about how to turn an unsaleable business into a business that's brimming with value at exit, and indeed, therefore, making it a much better business to run in the meantime. In this episode, we looked at the importance of getting your own IP, having a thorough understanding of your assets, the mechanics of running a business, and the best time to sell a business. So if you found this content interesting, which I certainly did, then make sure you tune into part two of our two-part series, which we'll be delivering to you next week, as long as you have subscribed to this podcast. And in part two, we look at handling asset deficiencies. We look at learning the lessons, resetting and reinventing. We look at strategies for turning a business into a saleable business and grooming for sale. And we also talk about the fastest way to create a breakthrough. Now, if you'd like to learn more information about this topic, or indeed, if you would like to find out how to contact Glenn or get involved in his program at Dent Global called KPI, Key Person of Influence, then just head over to our website at The Deal Room Podcast dot com or to the show notes and there we will link straight through to Glenn and Dent Global uh, and you'll also there be able to download a transcript of this podcast episode if you're one of those people who really likes the detail and wants to read through it in detail well we have the transcript for you there you'll also find details of how to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal if you or your clients would like to discuss any legal aspects of gearing your business up for an exit or indeed looking at acquisition, either to start a business or for using acquisition as a growth strategy within your business. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. So don't hesitate to book an appointment, a free appointment with one of our legal eagles if you would like to find out how we might be able to assist. Now, as I said, don't forget get to hit subscribe on your favorite podcast player in order that you get part two of this two-part series delivered straight through to your phone or your other device. But until then, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for listening in. You've been listening to Joanna Oki and the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to the Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.